Hello, test, 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 yeah. Commissioner Karen, uh, yes. Uh, our staff, Josephina, will be copying any comments or questions from Facebook and uh, from uh, this, yes. this to the chat box. Yeah, in the chat box. So if you see Josephina right. repeating, yeah. Comments or questions yeah. From Facebook. Okay. okay. So maybe Josephina can just say it's from Facebook or it's from YouTube. And then the ones in the chat box, uh, I, I can just mention. Thanks. Okay, we'll do that. Yeah, thanks. But just uh, you, you'll recognize Josephina putting many comments and questions in the chat box. Thanks. Good afternoon, everyone. This is Kumarendran. My pronouns are he, him, and I'm with the Human Rights Commission of Malaysia. I will assist you in walking through today's event. The event is being hosted from Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. It is about 3.29 p.m. here. And please feel free to use the chat box to introduce yourself, your organization, and where you are joining from. Allow me to share a few reminders uh, before we get started. Um, kindly use your name and organization as your username. We kindly ask you to mute yourself as background noise may disrupt the session and prevent the other participants from hearing the speakers. Apologies in advance, our technical support officers will be going around to mute those unmuted microphones. Kindly be informed that the event is being live streamed via Swakam official YouTube and Facebook pages. If you choose to turn on your camera and participate in the discussion, we take it as we have your consent. Alternatively, if there are any security and privacy concerns, you may follow the live streaming sessions instead. To make a comment or ask a question during the participatory sessions, participants may either use the chat box option or the raise hand option to ask the question directly to the floor. In the interest of time, we kindly request you to keep your interventions short and concise to ensure the space could be more inclusive. I would like to remind everyone that the spirit of today's discussion and dialogue is of constructive discussion to facilitate restoration of peace, human rights, and democracy in Myanmar. Hence, we urge participants to remain respectful and sensitive throughout their interventions. Thank you. Excellencies, chairpersons, and commissioners, esteemed speakers, distinguished guests, editors, and journalists, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the first regional dialogue on human rights and democratization in Myanmar, which aims to explore beyond the five-point consensus and reflect on possible options. 
Before we begin, we invite everyone here present here today to observe a 10 second silence in respect and to show our solidarity to over 900 lost life, thousands being displaced and suffering the violence attacks in Myanmar. We will now take a 10 second to observe the silence. Thank you, everyone. I'm now pleased to invite the chairperson of the Human Rights Commission of Malaysia, Suhakam, Mr. Otman Hashim, to deliver the welcoming remarks. Chairperson, the floor is all yours. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Kumar Reng. Excellencies, chairpersons and commissioners, editors and journalists, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the organizing partners, I would like to extend my warmest welcome to everyone to the first regional dialogue on human rights and democratization in Myanmar, which aims to explore beyond the five point consensus and reflect on possible options. Your presence at this dialogue is indeed a testament of your unwavering solidarity in upholding democracy, human rights, and peace in the region. This regional dialogue is the culmination of the ideas between SUHAKAM, the national human rights institutions in the Southeast Asia region, namely NHRI of Philippines, Indonesia, and Timor-Leste, and the ASEAN Intergovernmental Commission on Human Rights representatives from Indonesia, Malaysia, and Thailand, in response to the current crisis situation and human rights violations occurring in Myanmar following the military coup on 1st February 2021. A series of regional dialogue are anchored on fueling the momentum and continuous engagements in offering a regional perspective to the discourse on human rights in Myanmar as a platform to exchange information on the situation in Myanmar and collectively reflect on possible ways toward resolving the ongoing crisis. Ladies and gentlemen, the deteriorating condition of democracy and human rights catastrophe in Myanmar will have far reaching implications for its citizens in Myanmar and those outside the country, as well as having an impact on other countries, especially the neighboring ones. For example, the military coup in the violations of human rights in Myanmar have somehow affected these communities in Malaysia. They are deeply concerned about the safety and welfare of members of their families back home. There have been many instances they were not able to contact or even locate their family members. They are worried about the uncertainty of their future, especially among the refugees, as their hope to return to their country of origin is bleak. Similar anxieties among migrant workers from Myanmar who have to return to Myanmar during this period. The ongoing crisis in Myanmar has caused a cascade of reactions. It is detrimental to peace, security, and sustainable development, and generates potential massive insecurity with the fallout to the wider regions. As we gathered here, I would like to reflect upon a very short but powerful quote from Martin Luther King Jr. quote. Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere, unquote. Perhaps it is one of the most enduring and well-known quotes to say that it sums up the concept of universal human rights is an understatement. Human rights and justice are not confined to a particular society or geography. And one who chooses to remain ideal 
a major uh, human rights crisis is guilty of accomplish with the perpetrators. It has been more than five months since the military coup in Myanmar, where the political conflicts had escalated into a human rights catastrophe. There are photographic evidence and credible reports of extreme human rights abuses and escalation in violent attacks against the people carried out systematically by the authorities. The UN Special Reporters on the Situation of Human Rights in Myanmar, who is a speaker for the panel session today, in his report to the Human Rights Council stated that the condition in Myanmar was deteriorating and will likely get much worse without an immediate and robust international response in support of those under siege. More than ever, the current circumstances demand that states, the national communities, human rights organizations, and civil society movements unite in pursuit of restoring peace, democracy, and full respect for human rights in Myanmar. The suffering of the people of Myanmar is in a universal language and transcends race, religion, and creed. It is critical that we remain as a single voice and emphasize that the military government should halt all its attack on the people of Myanmar and return the country to democracy, reflecting the clear will of the people. Today's partnership in co-organizing co the regional dialogue is indeed the first attempt, and I hope there will be many more similar endeavors in the future. I am truly supportive of fostering uh, synergistic relationships between the national human rights institutions and the regional human rights mechanism, and propose that NHRIs in the region and IHR representatives explore possibilities to work in partnership to achieve our common interests as prescribed by our statutory functions and mandate. I would like to take this opportunity to encourage more participations and support from various stakeholders, including state and non-state actors, international communities and academia to the series of regional dialogues on human rights and democratization in Myanmar in the near future. I look forward to an enriching and meaningful discussion today. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you, Chairperson, for your powerful insights and setting the tone right for our session today. I now take the honor to invite His Excellency, Professor Dr. Amara Kongsapik, representative of iChar Thailand to deliver her welcoming remarks. Excellency, the floor is yours. Thank you. <clears throat> I'm going to be brief and say welcome all of us here who want to move forward to have regional dialogue towards peace. I'm very happy to see the collaborative regional dialogue happening today. I believe this is the first time that the National Human Rights Commission collaborate with ASEAN Human Rights Commission, even though informally. We have tried very hard to collaborate and this uh, I would think would, is the first time that it happens. I hope we will continue to collaborate further informally as well as formally. On the topic of Myanmar, we must face reality of the situation and accept the fact that we must deal with the situation openly. We should not stand still as if nothing has happened. This, the situation is now a regional issue, not national issue. 
Dialogue is one of the way to open up our communication channel. Hansen has proposed five channels in the meeting, in the ASEAN summit in April. We are here now to follow up on the proposals with the aim to move forward towards goal of regional peace. With that, I conclude by saying that I hope the discussion today will be constructive and help us move ahead peacefully. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Excellency. Uh, short, but always uh, very concise and meaningful. And um, we will now move forward to the next session. But before that, we will take a quick moment to take a um, photograph to capture our moment today. So I invite um, everyone to uh, turn on your cameras if possible. Our colleague uh, from the technical side will help us with taking the camera, uh, taking the snapshots. <laughs> Just for the record, we have 101 participants who are joining us today via Zoom today now. And probably they are more watching us uh, through Facebook and uh, our YouTube channel. So um, can, I, can I have a clue from the uh, technical staff? Is the snap start taken? Okay, yeah. So thank you. We will now uh, proceed with the next uh, agenda item of the day. I would like to now um, move forward to the opening remark, which will include updates on the human rights situation in Myanmar by Mr. Ong Myo Min, who is the Union Minister of the Ministry of Human Rights, National Unity Government of Myanmar. Uh, Mr. Ong Myo Min, the floor is all yours. Good afternoon, Excellency, Commissioners, and Distinguished Guests. Thank you so much for inviting me today. Dialogue on behalf of the National Unity Government. We are grateful for your active engagement in the Myanmar crisis and my appreciation to all organizations. First, let me acknowledge the National Unity Government is extremely horrified at their complete disintegration of democracy and human rights in Myanmar. Since the unlawful coup on the 1st of February 2021, the Myanmar military has conducted a systematic campaign of terror against the people of Myanmar. They have murdered more than 900 unarmed civilians and detained over 5,000 people, including leaders and members of parliament. In detention, Detainees are being routinely tortured, beaten, deprived of basic needs, subject to sexual violence, interrogated and killed. Additionally, children as young as four has been detained and as young as six has been killed, with the total of 75 children killed since the military coup. The escalating con conflict perpetrated by military in ethnic area has left a wake of brutal destruction, including murdering civilians with leather weapons, shelling of villages and places of worship, committing sexual violence against women, looting of property, burning of homes, causing over 250,000 people to be displaced and blocking and weaponizing life-saving aid. For instance, the military has blocked access to the Karani and Southern Shan states, restricting the free flow of humanitarian aid and banning rice and destroying medicines. A tactics of starvation, which amounts to a war crime. This served to increase further fear among those displaced and ensure that gender control aid for their own propaganda. 
this escalating conflict has worsened in already dire humanitarian crisis in many ethnic areas of Myanmar, which are still reading from decades of civil war perpetrated by the military and the ongoing effect of COVID-19 right now. The ASEAN and wider international response in the aftermath to the humanitarian crisis has not adequately met the moment. And complete shift towards supporting local humanitarian and community-based organizations which a do no harm baseline policy is needed. Um, turning towards the ASEAN response, I wish to draw your attention to the ASEAN five point consensus. It was not a consensus with all stakeholders within Myanmar, leaving out key actors, including the National Unity Government, Myanmar civil society organizations, ethnic and organizations, and most importantly, the people of Myanmar. While the energy welcome constructive dialogue and the attention to the situation in Myanmar, this must include all stakeholders for genuine, meaningful, and long lasting peace. As the Myanmar military was the only party from Myanmar included in the consensus, their agenda and viewpoints dominated the discussion and further their desire for legitimacy. In respect of this, the consensus is failing. We have seen an uh, explosional increase in violence and conflict at the hands of the Myanmar mil military, which do not take any action of ASEAN seriously. ASEAN just did not agree to timetable of actions or re repercussion for failure to comply with the consensus. And there's a still glaring lack of accountable effort on the part of the ASEAN to reach peaceful resolution. The mandate of national human rights institution is to respect, protect, and promote human rights of everyone in the country. However, people in Myanmar has not had any voices from the Myanmar National Human Rights Commission against the worst imaginable human rights violations, including actions that amount to war crime and crime against humanity, unfortunately. It was also true during the Rohingya genocide and previous conflicts in Yakai, Chin, Kachin, and current states. Right now, there is no place for Myanmar people to report their suffering of human rights violations and then no channel for them to call for justice in the country. We need a human rights institution that could receive complaints or document the human rights violations in a heightening level of vigilance during situation of conflict and coup dictator. The people of Myanmar continue to defend our nation from the grips of the Myanmar military, and we all must support them. The Myanmar military will continue to seek a grab power by means, any means necessary, unless the international community take a firm stance in support of Myanmar people and cooperate with the NUG and take concrete steps to hold the Myanmar military accountable for the growth crimes and human rights violations. The Myanmar military has enjoyed impunity over decades for grave human rights violations against the people of Myanmar, which has emboldened them to commit such unspeakable crimes in the current crisis. I implore you to take immediate and necessary steps to assist us in creating peace in Myanmar through coordinated international support, including pushing for global arms and war against Myanmar, calling for humanitarian assistance, which bypasses the military of Myanmar and focusing on cross-border and through local organizations. 
assisting the and to ensure ASEAN recognized and engages with the NUG and ethnic armed organization in its dialogue concerning resolution to the crisis in Myanmar. Promoting and protecting human rights violation, human rights in Myanmar through concrete effort by regional national human rights institution. Supporting a referral of human rights violation in Myanmar to the International Criminal Court. Supporting placing targeted sanctions on Myanmar military leadership, military business, and military affiliated businesses to cut the flow of funds to the military in Myanmar. We need your solidarity and support. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Mr. Ong um, Myo Mint. Um, our thoughts are with the people of Myanmar and we sincerely hope peace will be restored in Myanmar as soon as possible. Um, dear uh, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests uh, and participants, we will now move on to the next session. We will have a lineup of two panel discussions. The first panel discussion will be, will be moderated by um, Commissioner George Joseph, Joseph from um, the Commissioner of Human Rights of Malaysia, followed by an open discussion, which will be moderated by Honorable uh, Commissioner Karen from uh, the Human Rights Commission of the Philippines. Uh, without further ado, I hand over the floor to Commissioner George Joseph to uh, take the floor. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, thank you, uh, Kumarin. And uh, thank you to uh, Mr. Ong Myo Min, uh, Minister of Human Rights for the National Unity Government. Uh, thank you for coming on board to share. Uh, the the co-organizers of this event, and I'm very happy to say that uh, in ASEAN, uh, there are many of us who want a different type of region. Uh, so we, the Human Rights Commission of Malaysia, Human Rights Commission of Philippines, National Commission of Human Rights of Indonesia, and the Provador for Human Rights Justice and Timor-Leste are four human rights commissions in the region, together with the ASEAN Intergovernmental Commission on Human Rights, AICHA Indonesia, AICHA Thailand, and AICHA Malaysia, thought that we should have a space to talk about human rights in our neighborhood. And that's why we came about organizing this first regional dialogue. We hope to have uh, one or two more like this uh, in the next few months with the theme beyond the five point consensus, looking at other options available. So we were not opposed to the five point, but we said that it's five point plus. So there could be uh, other methods are needed. After listening to Mr. Ong Myo Min's sharing the atrocities and the hardships at the hands of, uh, of the present military government, I think we know that's not the way uh, forward. So this discussion, we will have uh, four wonderful speakers to give us their point of view. And just for the benefit of the 100 and uh, plus participants now with us, this five-point consensus is an ASEAN uh, leaders coming together and you know ASEAN is all about consensus so when they come together they said there's a they've reached a consensus on using this modality on the crisis in Myanmar so first there should be immediate cessation of violence in Myanmar and all parties shall exercise utmost restraint and this is a question we need to check uh, whether it is happening uh, or not the second the constructive dialogue among all parties council shall commence to seek peaceful solution in the interest of the people. So has that begun? Third, a special envoy of the ASEAN chair shall facilitate mediation of the dialogue process with the assistance of the Secretary General of ASEAN. And we are all waiting for this announcement by ASEAN on how they're going to move forward on this. Fourth, the ASEAN shall provide humanitarian assistance through the uh, AHA Center, ASEAN Humanitarian Assistance Center. And fifth, the special envoy and delegation shall visit Myanmar to meet with all parties concerned. So, uh, you know, all agreements are good on paper, but uh, we are watching for reality. And the people of Myanmar, I'm sure, 
want something uh, moving forward uh, based on this five point consensus. But on the background is that we want democracy and human rights in Myanmar. We want democracy and human rights in uh, our region, uh, in ASEAN. So let's work together on this. So to help us get deeper into the topic, we'll have of the four panel speakers, three are here with us live. And one, the UN Special Rapporteur on the Situation and Human Rights in Myanmar, Mr. Thomas, uh, is with us in spirit, but through a video only because of the time zone difference. It is, I think, 3 a.m. now in, in New York, I think, where he is based. So it was almost impossible to uh, have him join us. So he has graciously given us a video, but he's most willing to join us even at our next level. So uh, to start us off, we'll, we'll have uh, Her Excellency Yuyun Wahyuningrum, who's currently the AICHA Indonesia representative. She's also uh, completing her PhD uh, research on global regional interaction of human rights norm uh, with specific focus on ASEAN. And she's been a human rights activist for, for a long time. She knows the region well enough, both in Indonesia and also the region. So with, with that, I will invite uh, Her Excellency Yuyun uh, for a 10 minute presentation. And I will remind the speaker at eight minutes, uh, I'm sorry, I have to Inter, uh, interject at 8 minutes to remind you. Over to you, uh, Yuyun. Um, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Gerald. Thank you very much for having this uh, conference. Congratulate, congratulations to Suhakam, who is, all, who is also uh, the chair of SANEF, Southeast Asian National Human Institutions uh, Forum, uh, for having this uh, dialogue. This is very timely, and I would like to echo what uh, Commissioner Gerald mentioned earlier that uh, we want to have a different region as expected by Minister Ong Myo Min. Uh, we would like to have uh, Myanmar that is uh, uh, democratic. Uh, it was on the, in the process of going to, uh, to be democratic uh, uh, country, uh, got disrupted uh, by the coup. And we would like to see uh, the process of democratization uh, continue. And this is something that we would like to do at the regional and at the national level through our institutions. I prepared my PowerPoint presentation uh, uh, to make my talk uh, rather systematic. And I would like to um, uh, share the screen now. Uh, all right, so since I speak first, um, um, oh wait, here, yeah. Uh, since I'm, I'm, I'm speaking first, so uh, I would like to provide some of the background in relation to uh, Five Point Consensus. But the, the title given to me uh, is about the role of human rights mechanisms, national and regional in realizing the Five Point uh, Consensus. Uh, First, I would like to start with the ASEAN norms. Uh, ASEAN Charter uh, requests uh, ASEAN member states as well as ASEAN as a regional uh, organization to adhere to the rule of law, good governance, uh, human rights, uh, human rights, democracy, and and constitutional governments. Uh, uh, with what happened now in in uh, Myanmar with the coup, uh, basically uh, ASEAN continued to refer to these two uh, articles, Article 2.2H and 20.4. In the case of serious breach of the charter uh, and non-compliant, uh, the matter shall be referred to the ASEAN summit for decision. Uh, now ASEAN has a problem because uh, uh, this particular article has no uh, uh, a clear idea about uh, whether the the breaching or the decision that it is this act uh, considered as breaching the um, uh, the ASEAN uh, uh, norms in the ASEAN Charter, so so uh, uh, Article twenty point four uh, is not necessarily uh, uh, having immediate use uh, because it is unclear whether the summit will make a decision of the breaching or the decision to consider that act as a breaching. And uh, ASEAN has no uh, clause in relation to suspend uh, members, unfortunately. So so uh, uh, the idea was there, but not necessarily uh, followed. But uh, there has been a sentiment, strong sentiment 
uh, against uh, the coup uh, in, when the ASEAN social, uh, security community was discussed in 2004. As we can see in the document of ASEAN security community plan of action, uh, there has been uh, some kind of uh, dec not decision, it's like some kind of commitment among the ASEAN member states saying that ASEAN member countries shall not condone unconstitutional and undemocratic changes of government or use or the use of their territory for any action undermining peace, security, stability of other ASEAN member countries. So they have discussed about, uh, uh, about possibility of coup after the adoption of the uh, ASEAN political security community uh, and after the adoption of the ASEAN charter. So these are some of the norms that have been discussed uh, in in couple of years uh, in in ASEAN. So move to the current situation in Myanmar. As we know, um, uh, uh, ASEAN chairman uh, chairman statement uh, issued on the first February in the afternoon uh, of first February 2021. Some IC representative also responded to the situation by releasing a statement uh, on the 5th of February. Uh, in that time, only five uh, countries signed the uh, uh, chairman, uh, signed the uh, IHRAP's uh, statement. And we also know that there has been uh, subtle diplomacies and uh, intensive uh, lobbies uh, performed by our uh, foreign ministers. And on the uh, 2nd March, 2021, uh, ASEAN come up with the ASEAN chairman asking or calling Myanmar to stop violence, open dialogue with ASEAN and uh, express ASEAN readiness to assist Myanmar in that time. Uh, in April, in our meeting, in iChair meeting uh, in April, we also come up with the uh, agreement to discuss further on the issue of, of Myanmar under agenda item 15 on the current development of human rights in which we discuss uh, deeply and extensively uh, on the situation on Myanmar. Um, uh, six countries uh, uh, made a statement and uh, uh, addressed the concern in situation of Myanmar, especially on human rights situation. Uh, in the ICHAR press release on the 9th of April, we express uh, concerns as well as readiness for ICHAR to assist Myanmar on the task assigned by the ASEAN foreign ministers. Uh, according to our 4.14 uh, mandate as in uh, in our TOR, we um, foreign ministers can ask us anything. Uh, they can assign us to do many things. And this is uh, perhaps uh, the area in which we can use. Uh, so that is why uh, uh, the press statement mentioned about this particular uh, task. And on 24th of April, as we know, and Gerald also mentioned earlier, chairman statement included uh, uh, in the in the document the five point consensus. Uh, uh, but even before 24th April and after uh, 24th April, communication and coordination with the UN, with the international system, with the foreign governments continue uh, uh, to be performed by our foreign ministers uh, from Indonesia, from uh, Malaysia, from, from Singapore, uh, as we saw in the newspapers and also in their uh, Twitter handle. Um, we, I also know that uh, uh, Indonesian government made a lot of communication with CRPH as well as NUG. Uh, I think now uh, more and more countries, member of ASEAN, uh, made a contact uh, with NUG quite uh, quite uh, extensively uh, in terms of communication and uh, ad addressing some of the uh, situation as well as uh, uh, consult NUG on uh, um, on number of issues in relation to Myanmar crisis. Uh, we just finished our meeting yesterday. We are going to have another uh, meeting, uh, iChair special meeting on 26th of uh, July. But yesterday we uh, finally agreed to discuss about human, country human rights issues uh, under article, uh, under uh, agenda item four, in which uh, some countries may address other uh, countries' issues or their own countries' issues. So, so this is. Uh, maybe to respond to Minister Ong Yomin uh, earlier said, 
uh, in iChair, we we also tried all possible means uh, within our limitation, within our institutional uh, limitation, how to address uh, uh, issues in Myanmar, uh, not only outside of iChair, but also inside iChair, because we know when we discuss it inside iChair, it become institutionalized and it will be recognized formally on uh, what we have said and what we are going to, uh, uh, um, uh, what we uh, plan to address in relation to uh, uh, situation in Myanmar. Five point consensus mentioned earlier. Yun, but, uh, you have uh, two minutes more. Yeah. Uh, so this is five point consensus mentioned earlier by Gerald. I, I do not want to repeat, but what had happened after 24th of April, uh, we know that um, uh, on, um, uh, uh, Ming Ong Lei denied the Myanmar commitment to five point consensus, but rather tweak it into five uh, step to democracy. AHA Center has been coordinating uh, its work in, uh, in, in, in Jakarta, in different uh, cities, also in uh, ASEAN on uh, their preparation for humanitarian assistance. Uh, I also know there has been a number of um, simulation. Uh, I don't know how simulation happened, but they uh, they have number of discussion in relation to humanitarian simulation uh, uh, for Myanmar. Uh, Brunei delegation visited Myanmar and met with uh, uh, Ming Ong Lei. Uh, we still do not know uh, uh, who is the ASEAN envoy. There has been number of preferences as reported by media, but we do not know uh, the final decision. So these are the actors. I do not have to uh, um, uh, mention it. I think we all know the actors inside and outside of Myanmar in this situation. Uh, so uh, let me go to directly to the to this uh, uh, the the main idea of this uh, session. Uh, I would like to suggest that uh, uh, national human institution and regional human institution to continue to monitor and document human rights abuses highlighted and maintain a Myanmar crisis at the center of national, regional, and international news. Uh, there has been a, a, a concern now. We, we receive less and less news about situation in Myanmar, a part of uh, COVID-19. It is important concern, of course, but uh, we have less and less uh, information uh, from uh, Myanmar situation, uh, maybe because of the uh, uh, internet shutdown uh, the limitation of the connection uh, and the no um, independent media anymore in, in in Myanmar. I would also to suggest this kind of dialogue to continue and uh, further can be realized into more uh, actionable efforts. Uh, perhaps one of them is to, in, to issue joint statement uh, among national human institution and the regional human institution uh, addressing the, the situation in Myanmar collaboration with the international system. This come in this come naturally for a national human institution as well as the regional human institution like ICHER. Uh, consultation with stakeholders, including civil society organization. Uh, I hope that the next dialogue, we will be listening more uh, from people in Myanmar and civil society organization on how they envision uh, Myanmar in, in the future or near, uh, near future. Uh, at the same time, uh, IT representative individually continue to engage with our national government. For instance, uh, uh, I continue to engage with the Minister of Affairs of Indonesia to include some of the texts to be uh, inserted into joint communique or a German statement uh, as uh, 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 something that ASEAN can agree uh, in terms of action or commitment. And uh, if ASEAN envoy will be, uh, or if we know who will be the ASEAN envoy, uh, I would like to suggest that national human institutions uh, as well as ICHER to have a talk with the person and provide some of the advisory uh, services and advices how to include human rights into uh, the work of uh, mediating and uh, uh, talking to the people in Myanmar. I, yeah. I think you and I have to... Uh... Yeah. This is my lot, but I will not, I think this is a repetition of what my uh, my previous slide. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Excellency Yuyun.
for providing the background of uh, efforts done by at ASEAN uh, at the top, right up to the ICHA, to other bodies, and uh, uh, also proposals on how we continue uh, to push this uh, forward. Uh, that gives us a, a flavor already of all of us having a role in initiatives uh, for Myanmar. And having said that, I, I don't think uh, the reason we are here in solidarity in Myanmar is because we are any better. All our countries are struggling with democracy and human rights also. Uh, but we keep uh, pushing the, the borders of human rights in order uh, to make it better. So you don't have to be perfect to be in solidarity, uh, but it's a common joint project of the people of Southeast Asia. Our next speaker uh, is uh, Mr. Marzuki Darusman. Uh, former chair of the UN Independent International Fact-Finding Mission on Myanmar. Uh, the full account, the report, uh, mission report has been uh, released and uh, called on for investigation prosecution of the senior general, Min Aung Leng. Uh, also spoke about genocide. Uh, he's very well known as an international political figure. He chaired uh, the Komnasam, the Human Rights Commission of uh, Indonesia for a decade and served in the Interparliamentary Union and the ASEAN Working Group and Human Rights Mechanism. Really good to have you here, Mr. Marzuki uh, Darusman. Over to you uh, for your 10-minute presentation, please. Thank you, uh, Gerald. And uh, <clears throat> thank you for Suhakam and uh, the <clears throat> sponsors for uh, inviting me to just uh, exchange views. And thank you for the introduction uh, earlier on, actually, you did uh, offhand mention that uh, I was seen as a as a senior in the region, and and that has a way of uh, making people feel somewhat redundant. <laughs> but uh, then again, I would like to take advantage of that seniority by risking uh, saying things, uh, perhaps. Uh, preposterous, but being forgiven for that because uh, by the fact, the fact that I'm I'm uh, seen as a senior. So let me start by saying that uh, I, I take note uh, of what has been said uh, by these previous speakers and uh, take my cue from uh, what you have just mentioned that this is uh, a discussion. Uh, with a broader uh, perspective of looking at democracy within the, the region as a whole, but uh, uh, zeroing on uh, the situation in Myanmar at, at this uh, stage. And therefore, uh, looking at also at the, the theme of this uh, meeting, uh, unfortunately, not having the uh, Human Rights Commission from Myanmar uh, to attend, uh, if only because uh, there may have been a, a different uh, take of uh, the theme uh, beyond the five-point consensus looking at other options available. But I would like to just uh, take this in a very positive, in a more positive uh, uh, spin. And that is that uh, looking beyond the five-point uh, consensus is actually to look at the uh, phase uh, post five point consensus and to perhaps explore the the conditions that need to uh, to be in, in place for the five point consensus to be implemented uh, the way it was intended i would say that uh, asean has has come out with a bold uh, uh, what is this uh, position uh, reflecting the, the confidence of ASEAN as a, of itself that uh, this could be the framework that uh, would be responded to uh, positively by all the ASEAN members, including uh, the military junta at the moment in uh, Myanmar. But uh, going out from uh, what Minister uh, Mio has mentioned about uh, what took place on the 1st of February, uh, we are now into our sixth month, uh, perhaps going into the seventh month. And I would like to just throw this into the discussion, whether or not we might 
uh, uh, have to look at uh, not only uh, what needs to be looked into, but how to look at what is happening there in Myanmar. The theme uh, has a, uh, has a an analytical flavor to it, a uh, perspective, and uh, allows us to perhaps uh, explore uh, options as we move forward. And uh, a striking, of course, uh, with all due respect uh, to what has happened in terms of the uh, uh, sacrifices that have been uh, made by all those uh, have uh, preceded us and passed away and, and uh, having been victims of the uh, violence. Uh, a, a sort of a, a going over the ground uh, in a broad uh, perspective uh, and looking at it from, from the, the dynamics at the moment. Uh, should it be time for us to pose this question? And that is that after six months, uh, we don't really see that uh, any, any party to the conflict is able to uh, mobilize the combined political and military force to overcome the other party. Now, uh, this, may be, this may be somewhat uh, insensitive, uh, but uh, I would like to just bring this up, you know, because we do need to move forward in, in our thinking about this. And therefore, uh, going out from this, this, this particular sentence, you know, that neither parties to the dynamics have been able to muster and, and mobilize a combined political military force to overcome the other. Now, having said that, what is the, the, the take as we move forward? Now, uh, I will suggest that perhaps this may require a uh, revaluation of strategy of all uh, parties concerned. And that is uh, to, to gauge uh, how uh, confident are all the parties in uh, moving towards this next uh, suggestion. And, and that is that there may be a need for a, an overall uh, acknowledgement or statement by all parties of their readiness to engage with each other. And, and that, uh, I think, uh, may have to be addressed at some stage in the process. Now, this, of course, uh, may uh, uh, be seen as suggesting that, that uh, a number of compromises will have to be made. And now, having said that, of course, uh, we are all looking at this uh, uh, big game of uh, seeking recognition from the international uh, community. And that will end sooner uh, soon enough, uh, in September, uh, at the time when uh, the Credentials Committee of the uh, Commission of the UN will decide who will be representative of the Myanmar state and government. And therefore, uh, perhaps it might be premature to, to speculate if uh, parties may, may, may want to, uh, to uh, contemplate uh, giving up on their positions and to try to uh, come to terms with each other. But having said that, uh, it, it, will, it will certainly uh, be a turning point in September. And therefore, we don't know exactly what is uh, going to happen there. So in the meantime, uh, I would pro perhaps propose uh, that we look at two uh, conditions that need to be uh, put in place. One is, uh, again, uh, at the risk of reiterating what I've said uh, before, a, a general sense that parties may have to uh, somehow uh, look at the, their prospects uh, between now and September 
and uh, and, and uh, weigh uh, the, the pros and cons of of coming out publicly uh, uh, of its readiness to engage with each other. Uh, uh, secondly, uh, there will have to be uh, a somehow a, a way of moving forward on the uh, uh, COVID situation. Now. Uh, it may be, it may be not an, a, a, a correct analogy, but uh, what took place years ago in Aceh because of the tsunami, uh, that was instrumental in bringing together the uh, independence uh, movement and the Indonesian government to come to terms with each other and to strike a deal and to finally to resolve uh, their differences. But Marzuki now, are we? Are we looking uh, at yes? But, um, two, minutes I'm, uh, general, two minutes. Two yeah. minutes. Now I'm I'm looking at that possibility if, if it is uh, uh, realistic that that COVID, uh, with all due respect to the to the uh, uh, victims, that it could also be instrumental in bringing together all these parties together. That the 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 cases the the patients need to be given uh, the facilities to be uh, treated. Uh, victims who died of COVID need to be buried uh, properly. All these issues need to be addressed. And this could be a, a moment where uh, the national uh, spirit uh, brings together uh, all sides to address a calamity that uh, faces us all. So uh, just to quickly summarize, uh, Gerald, one, a blanket, unconditional statement of all parties of their readiness to come to terms with each other. And secondly, a mechanism for a massive humanitarian effort to address uh, the economic hardships, but also the pandemic. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Pamazuki, uh, for those two clear proposals. Uh, I just want to be a uh, little provocative. Uh, the, your topic was ASEAN and underpowered powerhouse. Are you suggesting that your first proposal and all party coming together, would that be facilitated or meditated by ASEAN or it's going to grow indigenously amongst them knowing their desperate situation? Uh, I would say, Gerald, that uh, looking beyond the five point, uh, point uh, it would be that, uh, of course, while this is a regional, as Professor Amara was saying, but at the end of the day, it will, be ha it will have to be a, uh, a Myanmar-led uh, process. And therefore, I, I'm, I'm uh, hoping that this could uh, take, uh, take, uh, take off within, within, the, within the situation in Myanmar uh, as we move forward. Thank you, Pak Mazuki, uh, for those thoughts. And also, I think pushing our colleagues, friends, and listening ears of all parties in Myanmar of the practical reality before them, uh, if they want to find some solution, because both sides of the divides don't seem to have very strong and absolute power. Times have changed. Uh, it forces all to the uh, negotiating table. But I think the other reality uh, on the from the Aceh experience is sometimes natural disasters can play uh, 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 a unifying role to find a solution faster. And we have COVID-19, as painful as it is for victims of COVID-19, it also may uh, present an opportune uh, possibility uh, for moving forward. Thank you, Pat Mazuki. Our third uh, presenter is uh, Mr. Thomas H. Andrews. Uh, is a UN Special Rapporteur on the Situation of Human Rights in Myanmar. As you may remember, since 1992, the then Commission on Human Rights, now Human Rights Council, had a resolution to set up this uh, uh, mechanism on the Special uh, Rapporteur on the Situation of Human Rights in Myanmar. This person's duty is to advise uh, and give input to the UN system through the Human Rights Council, to the General Assembly, on the situation in Myanmar. So this person, uh, Mr. Thomas, uh, is an expert uh, on this matter. He's a former Congress, uh, US Congress uh, a man from Maine. Uh, he's a Robina Senior Human Rights Fellow 
at the Yale University. He used to work for the National Democratic Institute, NDI. Uh, he's also linked to parliamentarians, NGOs, and political parties in different countries because of the work of NDI, ranging from Cambodia, Indonesia, Algeria, Croatia, Serbia, Ukraine, and Yemen. He's also served as a Secretary General on the Nobel Peace Laureate Campaign for Aung San Suu Kyi and the people of Burma in 2001, when that was another round of campaign uh, for freeing uh, uh, Myanmar. I think uh, with that, uh, we are very happy that we can hear his presentation via a pre-recorded video only for the reasons that it is now 3.30 a.m. in US, so he's not able to be with us live. Uh, but maybe the next round, we will try to find perhaps a better time that he could join us uh, uh, live on the panel. So with that uh, few words, uh, we will now uh, sit back and listen to his presentation uh, by Mr. Thomas Andrews. Thank you very much for the opportunity to participate in this important forum on human rights and democratization in Myanmar. I'm honored to join this very distinguished panel who bring significant expertise and perspective to this question. Today, we're being asked to look beyond the five-point consensus and consider other available options to address what has become a nightmare in Myanmar. And clearly, it is critical for governments in the region and the world to do exactly the same thing and to do it now. We are all painfully aware of the horrific conditions that the people of Myanmar must suffer through every day at the hands of a brutal military junta. The junta's military forces have murdered over 900 people, forcibly displaced hundreds of thousands, tortured many, including torturing people in custody to death, disappeared untold numbers, and arbitrarily detained well over 6,000. The junta continues to stifle freedom of expression and systematically strip away due process and fair trial rights. It is using criminal defamation charges to target journalists, human rights defenders, and civil society leaders. It has also cut off food, water, and medicine to those who have been displaced by its brutal attacks on entire villages. And it is taking family members hostage when its forces are unable to find those with outstanding arrest warrants. On top of all this, a third wave of COVID is taking hold of the country. An explosion of COVID cases, including the Delta variant, the collapse of Myanmar's healthcare system, and the deep mistrust of the people of Myanmar to anything connected to the military junta are a perfect storm of factors that are causing and will continue to cause a significant loss of life. As of last week, there were 240 documented attacks by the Hunter forces against healthcare professionals and facilities. But despite facing lethal force, people across Myanmar continue to vigorously oppose the Hunta and demand that it end its attempted coup. And I say attempted coup quite deliberately here. The junta captured many levers of state power, the purse strings of Myanmar's treasury, the administrative offices, but it has not, not even close, taken control of the nation and its people. The people of Myanmar roundly view the junta as illegitimate and indeed a terrorist scourge set loose upon them. The national unity government is laying the groundwork for a new unified Myanmar and it has taken the historic step of welcoming the Rohingya ethnic minority back into the national fabric of Myanmar, assuring them justice and full citizenship rights. It is helping to coordinate humanitarian assistance into the country and is committed to ensuring international justice and accountability for victims of atrocity crimes, indicating its willingness to pursue justice through the International Criminal Court. Some in Myanmar have lost hope that help from the international community will not be forthcoming and have instead sought to defend themselves through the formation of defense forces and acts of sabotage while some are reportedly targeting suspected junta collaborators and officials. This trend could escalate quite quickly and the junta's pattern of the use of grossly disproportionate force in response 
will likely lead to an even greater loss of life. The people of Myanmar are working to save their country, but they desperately need the active support of the international community before it is too late. There has been a series of attempts by the international community to address this crisis. Bodies of the United Nations, including the General Assembly, the UN Security Council, the UN Human Rights Council, have met to discuss developments and issue statements and pass various resolutions. And of course, ASEAN has taken an active role with a process that it hoped would foster constructive dialogue and a way forward for Myanmar. It is painfully obvious that it has done neither. Most appreciate this important effort, and they recognize that the lack of progress is not due to this important initiative by ASEAN. It is due precisely to the leader of the military junta, Min Aung Hlaing, who saw this effort not as a way to find common ground and a way out of the catastrophe that he has created in Myanmar, but as a way to cynically manipulate the goodwill of the region as a propaganda tool. He made a mockery of the five-point consensus almost immediately upon returning to Myanmar by dismissing these points, including the call for the cessation of violence as, in his words, suggestions that he would consider once he has defeated the many who oppose him. The brutal fact is that there will be no end to the nightmare that is daily life in Myanmar, no end to this crisis, until the one who caused it and continues to drive it, Min Aung Hlaing, is forced to recognize that his attempted coup has failed and that the only way out is to bring this illegal, unsustainable military junta to an end. For this to occur, strong, coordinated, and unrelenting pressure must be imposed by the international community. There is no other way forward, and the longer it takes to recognize this fact, and to take the requisite action, the longer the suffering, the greater the loss of life, and the greater the threat Myanmar poses to the region and to the world. That is why I have called for the formation of an emergency coalition for the people of Myanmar, nations willing to join together to stand with and for the people of Myanmar through strong, meaningful, coordinated action. I base this recommendation on the necessity for action and the idea that governments that are willing to take action should do so even if others are not. The fact is, doing what is necessary will not occur by consensus, by the commitment, but by the commitment of those who are willing to take action. Over the last five and a half months, we have witnessed what happens when there is a lack of this kind of action. We therefore know with virtual certainty that if the international community continues on its current course, things will continue to deteriorate for the people of Myanmar. An emergency coalition for the people of Myanmar would be in a position to impose significant costs on the junta. It could reduce the junta's ability to attack its citizens, save the lives of those in acute crisis, and gain political leverage so that the crisis in Myanmar might come to a just and permanent conclusion. There are five viable options that such a coalition would have to achieve these goals. First and foremost, an emergency coalition could significantly reduce the revenue that the junta needs to continue its reign of terror. The junta prides itself on its large, well-equipped military, but what they see as a source of strength, indeed the only reason they're able to hold the people of Myanmar hostage, is also a vulnerability. It takes considerable revenue to supply, equip, and sustain that military. Cut off their income, and you cut off their capacity to continue their relentless attack on the people of Myanmar. Since the coup, some countries have instituted sanctions targeting military control enterprises and revenue from gems, timber, and mining. Two countries sanctioned the so-called state administrative of council, the junta itself. These are important steps, but the fact remains that many nations have yet to impose any sanctions, and a key sector remains untouched by all, oil and gas. Oil and gas sector revenues are a financial lifeline for the junta and are estimated to be close to what is needed for the junta to maintain security forces that are keeping them in power. They should be stopped. 
Second, an emergency coalition for the people of Myanmar could outlaw the export of arms to the Myanmar military as called for in a resolution passed last month by the United Nations General Assembly. Third, coalition members that have universal jurisdiction laws could coordinate investigations of these ongoing crimes and make preparations to file charges against Myanmar's senior security officials. Fourth, coalition members could dramatically increase humanitarian aid by working with the National Unity Government to utilize non-hunted channels to assure that aid goes to where it belongs, to the people of Myanmar. And finally, fifth, the coalition could work together to deny any claims of legitimacy that the junta may try to assert, such as the false claim that they are recognized by the United Nations. These actions are all possible, but they require nations that are prepared to act do so by collaborating outside of the formal mechanisms that require consensus. Frankly, consensus decision-making has meant paralysis, and paralysis is lethal to the people of Myanmar. Of course, there is no guarantee that this approach will succeed, but there is overwhelming evidence that the current path that we're on leads to even greater impunity, a humanitarian disaster, and a failed state. As I told the UN Human Rights Council last week, future generations may look back upon this moment and ask, did the people and nations of the world do all that they reasonably could to help the people of Myanmar in their hour of great peril and need? I'm afraid that the honest answer to that question, at least at this point, is no. The international community is failing the people of Myanmar. There is still time to set a new course and achieve a just outcome. Now more than ever, we must summon the courage of the people of Myanmar and choose the path of meaningful and sustained action. Time is short and the stakes could not be high. Thank you for your kind attention, and thank you for the opportunity to participate in this important. Uh, we thank uh, that message, a very clear, powerful analysis, and also way forward by Mr. Thomas uh, Andrews, the special rapporteur on uh, the situation of human rights in Myanmar. I think he's, uh, he's put out the honest truth about our hope for the international community, uh, if going at the present rate of uh, slow movement, uh, both at the ASEAN region as well as the UN body, uh, the longer we wait, the longer the suffering will be. So he has proposed a coalition of the willing uh, to, to move forward on this. I think uh, it's uh, something that must be considered because uh, not doing anything and moving uh, the agenda faster is really going to, uh, will be to the detriment of the people in Myanmar. So I think the question of the international community's role and function in Myanmar is again brought to attention. Remember this uh, maybe 15, 20 years ago, uh, many question the inability of, of then uh, international community to move on the Myanmar agenda. So, so we will take uh, his points and maybe at the open discussion, uh, colleagues, uh, participants, uh, you're invited to write your comments or your questions in the chat box, both uh, here in Zoom or in Facebook or even in YouTube, uh, so that our next session of interaction, uh, uh, we may be able to pick uh, those thoughts and comments uh, for the benefit of the panelists uh, to, uh, to make comments on that. But thank you again, uh, Mr. Thomas. Uh, our last panelist for today, uh, before I introduce her, uh, I think uh, Mr. Marzuki mentioned that uh, it was a pity we don't have the participation of uh, the Myanmar Human Rights Commission and Aicha Myanmar. Uh, just for the benefit of all those present, uh, Suhakam and the other co-organizers have invited both the Myanmar Human Rights Commission and the Aicha Myanmar to, uh, to be present as well as to give opening statements uh, so that we can hear them. But unfortunately, they are not utilizing a space of dialogue. We're calling it a regional dialogue. 
uh, let's pray and hope that the next time we do it, we, we can uh, can get them to, to join us, uh, whatever differences, but we must be able to sit together to talk uh, uh, together. With that uh, information, I would like to call upon uh, Ms. Razia Sultana, the founder of RW Welfare Society, a lawyer and a Rohingya human rights activist uh, who has uh, done a lot of work on the ground. Uh, she's a chairperson of the organization, which is a grassroots organization based in Bangladesh, working to prevent human trafficking and to support refugee women. Her work focuses on a very difficult area of work, the trauma, mass rape, and trafficking of Rohingya girls and women. She was born in Myanmar, but raised in neighborhood Bangladesh. Uh, Razia has been a courageous advocate for Rohingya rights and works with some of the hundreds of thousands of Rohingya refugees in refugee camps in the Cox Bazaar region of Bangladesh. Uh, so we're very happy and pleased that we have Razia Sultana with us. Uh, over to you, Razia. You have your 10 minutes. Thank you. Yes, please go ahead, Razia. Thank you. It's a bit soft, Razia. Yeah, okay. Uh, Assalamu alaikum. And yes, very good. Thank you. Good afternoon. I am Razia Sultana, a human rights activist and founder of RW Welfare Society, who started their work uh, to support Rohingya women who face indescribable crucial violence. Doing advocacy for uh, with vulnerable community and seeking justice, peace, and freedom, and asking uh, dignified solution what they deserve in our human. <laughs> so, I think uh, uh, I will start my summarizing. Uh, Uh, summarizing the worsening situation for Rohingya refugees in Bangladesh during the COVID pandemic, um, then I will talk about the impact of the uh, recent COVID. The Rohingya refugees in Bangladesh were already facing great hardship uh, before COVID. Uh, they were suffering from overcrowding, um, lack of sufficient service and access to uh, education. Their flimsy plastic and bamboo shelter were easily damaged by monsoon rains and uh, mudslide. Now, because of COVID, they are facing increased um, uh, suffering from the tight restriction on the movement in the camp. This is limiting, uh, eliminating uh, economic activity, such as running a small shop, which enable refugees to earn human income. Humanitarian services have been limited, including children's service, such as a friendly space, also women friendly space. Criminal gangs are taking advantage of the situation and expand their influence. Uh, influence. The hardship is causing more gender-based violence in families. There are more child marriage and women and girls are more vulnerable to human trafficking. Between March uh, 2019 and March 2000, uh, 2020, even COVID began around 15,000 uh, 15, Rohingya were trafficked from Bangladesh, most of them women and children. <clears throat> Out of uh, desperation, Rohingya refugees have been continuing to risk um, uh, the dangerous journey across the sea to find a better life. Just last month, 81 Rohingya refugees arrived on the coast of Aceh, Indonesia, after being, um, uh, after being at sea for three months. Nine had died during uh, in the journey. The military coup on February uh, 1st uh, has made many Rohingya feel more hopeless about being able to return home. And they are uh, they worrying that uh, the Burma army will drive out the last remaining Rohingya from Arakan. The coup. Um, the COP regime is uh, making it clear internationally that the Rohingya will not accept uh, uh, internationally that they will not accept Rohingya. Uh, 
in May, Ming online told um, Chinese TV station that Rohingya do not exist in Myanmar. The regime is also shamelessly trying to shimmer the democratic opposition as a link to ARSA. In other world, Islamic uh, other uh, in other uh, words, Islamic terrorists. When in fact, ARSA was their own creation. The so-called ARSA attack in 2017 were just false flag attack uh, attack uh, staged by uh, the Burma army as a uh, pretext to drive out the Rohingya. The Burmese, the Burmese language state media are also uh, studying up Islamophobic uh, racism once again. Last month, the article uh, in the mirror tries to stir up the uh, fear of Rohingya population expansion in Arakan using false data. For example, it said that Bengalis were 80% of the population in Rathidong Township, when in fact the Rohingya are now only about 5% of the population. But one uh, positive result of the COVID has been that the general public in Myanmar are finally starting to believe the atrocity that the Burma army committed against the Rohingya because they are now experiencing these atrocities themselves. There have been many messages on social media about this. Member of the member of the former LND uh, government are also expressing a regard about the treatment of the Rohingya. Susanna Hasu, uh, an elected uh, NLD MP, and now the Minister of Women, Youth, and Children Affairs of the Opposition National Unity Government, made a public apology about uh, the past NLD government's failure to speak out about the Rohingya. This was in April, only a week after the news was formed. The news issued a formal statement on May 30, uh, 30 pleading to cooperate with the ICJ on the Rohingya genocide case and expressing concern about the difficult situation of the Rohingya in Bangladesh. This is very significant because it is a uh, reversal of the position of the former LND government which defended the, Bur the Burma army at ICJ. And very importantly, one, uh, on th uh, 3rd June, the news issued a de uh, details public position on the Rohingya. They said they were deeply um, uh, saddened by the gross, uh, gross human rights violation against the Rohingya and said they would seek justice and accountability. They said they would um, repeal the 1982 citizenship law. They would ensure citizenship by birth and would abolish the NBC card. They also said they were committed to voluntarily safe and dignified return of Rohingya refugees. These are all very welcome promises, but unfortunately, the NUJ did not commit to recognizing Rohingya as an indigenous to Arkan state and equal to other ethnic cities of Burma. This is our basic demand and the only way we can uh, guarantee our rights in Burma. Anyway, it is clear that the Rohingya have much more hope of obtaining our rights under the NUJ than under the SAC. I was uh, asked uh, to suggest an option to address the current crisis in Burma. The main point I wanted to make is that the international community must learn from first past uh, mistake with Burma. The war let the Burma army get away the ge with genocide and carried on business as usual with Burma for their own self-interest. The involved the Burma army to stage a coup. And I want you to remind people that the world did not only let the Burmese military get away with genocide, they also let them get away with mass rape and killing of Rohingya women and girls. Not a single soldier um, uh, was held responsible for this, meaning that thousands of um, uni uh, uniformed rapists are now on the laws thought out in Burma with license to rape with impunity.
This is the report I published in 2018 with the details, the documentation of gang rape, murder, and mutilation of hundreds of Rohingya women, girls, also men. Carrying on business as usual uh, with the SAC regime in Burma will spell disaster not only for Burma, but the whole region. The civil war will escalate. The military will commit more and more atrocities against civilians, including sexual violence. The economic the economy will collapse. This will cause large scale humanitarian disaster and lead to more refugee fleeing the country into neighboring countries and the region. Therefore, the only solution to Burma crisis is to apply maximum pressure on SAC or to force into a step down uh, from power. I therefore urge Burmese neighboring countries and ASEAN members not to recognize the SAC reason, to cut all economic revenue to the reason, to stop all development aid to the reason, to stop arms sales and any military cooperation with the region, to support the ICJ case against Burma, to stop referral of the situation in Burma to ICC, to implement a human development program in the Rohingya refugee camps, to conduct sustainable women and children protection and empowerment projects, to increase cross-border humanitarian support, and finally to give refugee to all asylum seekers from Burma. I thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Razia Sultana, for that very good presentation. And you've been strong to, to handle this for so many years. Uh, the atrocities, uh, both in the Arakan state and when they become refugees in Cox Bazaar. Uh, our hopes are with you that uh, something better comes out of it. But uh, I think your proposal on how to move forward and to also now you have a comparison uh, and the NUG's own position is an important marker on what the future lies for uh, four millions of uh, refugees. Eh? Uh, you shared about the, the Rohingyas, but also, I know there are thousands of other ethnic uh, Myanmar also in other countries. Not sure where to go because they were starting the move to move back home after democracy came back. And now it's round two or round three of this uh, crisis. But thank you so much uh, for that presentation. So uh, I think we've come to the, uh, uh, to the end of the presentations and the reflections and the thoughtful provocations on what should be our thoughts for, for moving uh, this Myanmar issue of democracy and human rights crisis uh, forward. I think we got an international perspective, a regional perspective, but also a Myanmar perspective of the all parties. You know, that's the tough part, you know, at home. And also the military uh, survives only because it must pay its soldiers, it must have the big machinery and the guns. So even the money in and money out is a question that has been on our lips for I don't know how many decades. But that's never been successful because money is still going in uh, to oil the machinery. So there was, I think, something that uh, uh, Thomas Andrews did mention. And I think many of us are also thinking. So uh, thank you so much to all presenters uh, for taking us off on a really uh, powerful reflection on the first regional dialogue. Uh, and also to Minister uh, um, Ong Myo Min, uh, who laid the ground on what's happening. Uh, so that gives us now a good uh, time, almost 55 minutes of a dialogue uh, with all panel speakers. So again, invite you to make your comments on the chat box, in the uh, Facebook comment section, and in uh, YouTube. And with this, I will uh, very gladly invite uh, my colleague, Commissioner Karen Gomez uh, from the Commission of Human Rights Philippines to take over from here for the discussion. Over to you, Karen. Thank you very much, Commissioner Gerald. It's indeed a pleasure to be here with you on this maiden regional dialogue on human rights and democratization in Myanmar. Thank you to all the panel speakers for sharing your thoughts. And I think uh, that will really... Um, um, trigger a lot of uh, questions and comments from our, uh, from our participants who are joining us from uh, Zoom, in our Zoom room today, from YouTube, 
and also Facebook Live. Just to be able to say as well that we do encourage uh, uh, inputs from all the participants either orally or via the Zoom chat box, YouTube comments, or Facebook comments that will be relayed to me via Viber. So we're all on a, a pure online platform here. Um, just to be able to also say that um, uh, we remind our participants to raise their concerns or views in a very respectful manner and a constructive uh, manner as well. And I will acknowledge you if you would like to take the floor um, uh, through your raised hand via uh, our chat box, uh, via our Zoom facility, and also I will be prompted as well to do that. I'd like to also invite you to limit your, um, uh, your questions to under a minute and perhaps your comments to under two minutes as well so that we can give everyone the chance to be able to participate and deepen the discussions that have been laid out by our panel speakers. So to start off, um, uh, I'd like to check uh, who would like to, um, to raise their hands. I currently do not see any raised hands right now. So allow me to just uh, perhaps invite the first person who actually commented on the uh, chat box. And this is from uh, Mr. Saidu Dogongida. Uh, and this is from the Zoom chat box. Would you like to um, give your oral intervention or just uh, state your um, uh, comments? that you have um, posted on uh, our chat box. Is that possible? Mr. Gida, are you there? Just open the mic and uh, speak. We invite you to speak and take the floor. I still don't see him. So maybe what I can do is just um, uh, uh, read uh, what uh, he said. Uh, there's a strong link between democracy and human rights, peace and security. Critical situations in my, Myanmar are a common concern, and not only for ASEAN countries, but for all human rights defenders. And he said that as a magistrate and human rights defender, uh, we need to stop grave violations of human rights ongoing in Myanmar, and a regional dialogue is indeed good. Uh, I invite you to also um, uh, uh, take a look at his post. Um, uh, he did suggest that um, uh, uh, we need to adopt binding rules to create an ASEAN criminal court to pursue high, uh, uh, well, uh, to pursue the grave violations of human rights. So first stage is to adopt an ASEAN statement on democracy and human rights. Second state is to adopt um, um, an ASEAN, an ASEAN charter. Uh, which is binding on democracy and human rights. Third stage is obligation for states, members to produce, report um, uh, each two th or th three or more years on the implementation of the provisions of the charter and at the end, create a common criminal court um, uh, Well, um, by experts of member states. Okay. Um, there is a question here that I would like to read. Um, and this is from Jose Pereira of Timor-Leste. I would like to raise a question. And this is for um, uh, 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 my kapatid Yuyun um, from in Indonesia. Based on her presentation, it's clear that there is a clear violation or non-compliance of the ASEAN Charter by the Myanmar military government. And there has been serious violations of human rights taking place there. Why is there no concrete action taken by ASEAN or ICER to initiate a peaceful dialogue or um, mediation to find a peaceful solution for the situation? Um, uh, perhaps we can go with that and then I'll gather more questions as we go along. Yuyun, you have the floor. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Karen. Thank you uh, the question, for the question, uh, Jose Pereira. Um, so the concrete action uh, actually in, in the context of, of ASEAN is to release uh, a statement uh, specifying the uh, uh, country situation. Uh, ASEAN has been 
very rare of releasing any statement in relation to a country, one specific country. So this is something uh, not usual for ASEAN to come up with one. Uh, so this is the concrete action by ASEAN. Uh, ASEAN is limited by its limitation of possible action. So for instance, uh, ASEAN cannot uh, uh, remove the members if the member uh, violate or non-compliant to the norms. Uh, the article 20.4 only said that uh, the issue need to be tabled in summit. So that, that's it. So it is unclear whether to decide the, the summit to decide or to remove the members. So so there is no such a, a clear idea on, on, on this. So I think ASEAN now facing uh, uh, the problem of their own uh, limitation uh, on dealing with uh, its members or discipline the members. In in relation to ICER, we have been, uh, uh, we cannot, Punish. We cannot sanction. This is not the way uh, human rights uh, commission uh, do things uh, around the world. Uh, but we have been trying to uh, uh, make sure that Myanmar receive the message of uh, we are very disappointed. We are very concerned about the situation uh, uh, in the country. Um, so in the in the third in the previous meeting in April. We table uh, the intention of having uh, the discussion, and it was granted. Uh, in the in the uh, meeting just now, uh, we had uh, a deadlock for two days because um, Indonesia, Malaysia, Thailand, Philippines, and Singapore uh, suggested to have the uh, agenda on uh, to discuss about human or human rights situation in the country and Myanmar disagree, so we had a deadlock. So finally, we, we have it uh, in agenda item four now uh, to discuss, uh, so IHR representative can discuss about country specific issues on voluntary basis. Uh, so this is perhaps a one way to, to do uh, uh, on discuss the situation. Uh, what we can do in ASEAN is rather peer pressure that's the concrete action that we can. It, we cannot uh, sanction, we cannot remove the members, uh, but we can make a, a member of ASEAN listen the painful of being complained by the rest of the uh, members of ASEAN. Thank you very much uh, for that um, uh, uh, response. Maybe perhaps what I can do is confine the uh, questions first and the comments uh, within ASEAN. And I would like to, of course, um, just uh, uh, react to that. And perhaps this is one thing that uh, was said by our speaker uh, uh, earlier um, on uh, the UN Special Rapporteur saying that outside of the consensus decision-making uh, process, and that's actually, he referred to it as a paralysis. And uh, uh, do you think that this is... Uh, this is a proper characterization of the ASEAN's um, uh, methods and uh, procedure that it is uh, building on consensus and deciding by consensus. But uh, the earlier question uh, that was posed was that you actually hit the nail on the head because you did mention the ASE ASEAN Security Community Plan of Action of 2004 saying that a provision there says that uh, uh, ASEAN member countries shall not condone changes of government on the use of their territory for any action undermining peace, security, stability in the ASEAN. So is that now something that uh, ASEAN can go ahead with? And apparently, um, uh, if we um, take on this particular provision, as you would say, say then ASEAN is not really paralyzed in uh, taking action. Mm -hmm. um, don't you think so? Let me address the consensus. Uh, yes, consensus can be uh, a limitation, can be a, can be uh, something that paralyzes ASEAN, but also vice versa. What we have uh, uh, performed uh, in our meeting in I, uh, in ICHAR is that we use the non-consensus of Myanmar asking to remove the agenda to discuss about human rights. So that is why 
the reason why we had deadlock for two days because we used that opportunity to 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 veto uh, what Myanmar wants of not having the agenda. But now we have the agenda. Uh, so the provision that I mentioned earlier in the security community, so it actually give the uh, history, the background history that ASEAN did discuss about this. ASEAN was disturbed about uh, member countries that always uh, or, or like to do the, the coup, uh, regardless which country uh, or members. And they discuss about this and explore possibilities. They also talk about sanction, they talk about uh, removing members, expelling members. But in that time, there was no agreement over what uh, supposed to be happen as a sanction or as the uh, uh, outcome of the coup. Uh, uh, with the hope that by mentioning that all ASEAN member states should adhere to the constitutional government, there has there is uh, there was a expectation that all countries will follow. All countries, a uh, member of ASEAN, gradually will respect that kind of norms. Uh, but apparently now ASEAN faced the fact and reality that not all member states respect the norms. So it, it, it so maybe after all this, uh, 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 the, after Myanmar crisis will end, uh, ASEAN need to think about how to to review the, uh, the ASEAN Charter. ASEAN Charter was supposed, supposed to be reviewed uh, in 2018 or 2019. Uh, uh, and and uh, maybe ASEAN need to revisit this particular uh, article uh, on constitutional government and, and uh, what possibly sanction, what possible sanction for member state who breaching the norms. Thank you very much. I have another question here. Again, it's uh, related uh, to the context of uh, the ASEAN. And uh, uh, what is the impact of Brunei's visit to Myanmar domestically and regionally and how it impacted other ASEAN countries in humanitarian assistance to Myanmar? That's from Nick Salida via Zoom chat box. And then... Um, uh, Perhaps I can also um, direct that question to uh, Marzuki. Um, I'm looking for one other question here. Um, uh, if you can give me a little time because a lot of people have been. Okay. Um, oh, I think it's the same. Oh, here it is. Uh, two proposals caught my attention. This is according to Nancy Chim Heimer from the Zoom chat box as well. Myanmar led initiative on the blanket unconditional statement of all parties. This to me is like going to square one, but it might be the right way for it, forms a solid start of negotiation. And second, the coalition of the women. So the question is, what are the two feasibilities of the two proposals that seem to be contradictory according to her in practical terms and how to move ahead with these proposals? Thank you very much. So perhaps Marzuki can answer that question. Uh, hello. Hi, uh, Karen. Am I getting through? Uh, sorry. I'm just yes, yes, you the... are. Yeah, yes, correct. you are. Thank you. Thank you uh, <clears throat> for the uh, opportunity to address <clears throat> some of these points and the, the question. May, may I just start by uh, making, making this... Uh, observation, if you will, you know, that uh, the, the visit by ASEAN chair and, and the Secretary General, of course, uh, follows on the five-point uh, uh, consensus. Uh, but what does come out of it is a, a distinct impression that, that uh, ASEAN can only operate at the pleasure of the junta. And therefore, uh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't uh, fall back on, on this uh, track uh, immediately. Uh, but as the theme of this uh, webinar uh, indicates, to just look at what, what are the feasible uh, tracks in moving forward. 
And uh, that seems to be, uh, at the moment, to look into possibilities within uh, the country. Uh, and uh, so, uh, one or two issues that need to be clarified. And this is something that we need to uh, come to terms with. One is the notion that, that uh, while painting a grim picture, obviously it, the situation is, is deteriorating and, and, and uh, becoming even worse uh, on a daily basis. In terms of, in terms of uh, one can't even begin to imagine the, the, the human agony that prevails on the streets of Yangon and, and all over uh, Yangon, uh, Myanmar. Uh, as a result of the, the reign of terror uh, by the junta. But uh, you have to also acknowledge the, the heroism and the resolve of the people of Myanmar to fight back. And, and therefore, this is, this is the, the core of the dynamic, and, and that is the, the standoff between the two sides here, if you will. Uh, and, and therefore, uh, it is probably more productive to look at what could be explored within that dynamic of a standoff between the two sides. Uh, we, we are all agreed, you know, that, that something needs to be done immediately, even yesterday, uh, to alleviate the, the suffering, the, the wrongdoing, the, the egregious, uh, horrific behavior of the junta that goes back to 2017 with regard to the Rohingya that was very uh, graphically pictured by uh, Razia uh, just now. Uh, those are granted issues that we have to acknowledge. But then, as, as uh, we, we want to look at uh, where do we go from here, uh, two things. One, uh, this notion of a failed state. I wouldn't, I wouldn't draw a conclusion that Myanmar is on its way to a status of a failed state. Uh, the, the people have taken uh, uh, issues, uh, matters to their own hands, even uh, under the COVID uh, uh, conditions, uh, the network of collaboration and then the resolve and the, and the resourceful uh, actions taken by the uh, civil society movement is impressive. Uh, and so uh, there is a resilience there that, that's, that's uh, evident. Yeah? Uh, and so uh, we should stay away because this is a line that's going to be taken by those who want to picture Myanmar ending up as a failed state and therefore uh, for the international community uh, to uh, have to, for, to, uh, uh, to uh, recognize the effective power in the country as being uh, the party to deal with. That is the track that ends uh, if you take this uh, failed state notion uh, as a parameter. Secondly, uh, to, a, to equate the, the violence uh, that is, is taking place and, and drawing a parity between the CDM and the junta as being both uh, uh, being called upon to seize uh, violence is grotesque. The CDM is not involved in violence. And therefore, uh, this is something that uh, I think uh, is an oversight by ASEAN. But uh, nevertheless, uh, I'd like to point this out uh, clearly that that is an issue uh, that needs to be uh, addressed. Now, as we move forward, there have been and there will continue to be so many observations and so many uh, options uh, up for offer. Uh, to resolve the situation in Myanmar. Uh, but the single track that uh, all parties would be able readily to uh, get onto is the accountability track. And therefore, uh, it, it, it may be time for ASEAN, for into the international community, for the CSOs, for all parties to call for a resolution to create 
an international jurisdiction to allow prosecutions to start against those most responsible for the uh, violations that have taken place since 2017, going even further back, including, including the brazenly cruel treatment uh, and inhuman treatment by the junta on the uh, COVID infected, affected uh, population. So uh, if we want to uh, end the, the, the suffering, then we do need to get on this accountability track even earlier than what was envisaged by the UN by setting up this uh, double IM mechanism in Geneva. They are ready uh, as soon as an international jurisdiction is created uh, for the means of prosecuting these, uh, uh, those responsible. Finally, uh, Karen, if I may, and this goes to ASEAN, this non-interference notion mm -hmm. is a divisive concept. It uh, separates uh, states in ASEAN because every ASEAN state is required to be vigilant against interference by their neighbors. And therefore, the, the demon of non-interference has to be exorcised from the ASEAN body politic. And, and that is the way forward as we confront the new challenges of the 21st century in ASEAN. So uh, uh, there is a standoff, certainly, but uh, we want to avoid a stalemate uh, as of September. And as I indicated, uh, that will be the uh, battle uh, that will determine uh, things to come. Uh, who is the UN, UN going to recognize as the state? Now, as things stand, uh, the people and the territory are not in the hands of the junta. And so the NUG is the legitimate government of Myanmar. And therefore, it merits being recognized as the sole legitimate government of Myanmar. And then that's the baseline that we will have to uh, go out from uh, in, in terms of addressing uh, the immediate situation after five point uh, uh, consensus. Let's, let, it's not to bypass the five point consensus, Aaron, but it is to find a way forward. And I'm, I'm coming back again, and, and this may be a soul searching uh, process for both sides. Can, can all parties start contemplating that they will have to deal with each other uh, at some stage? Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Marzuki. I guess, um, uh, in a way, you have actually answered uh, partially the question of Andrew Ku uh, via Zoom chat. And he was uh, asking uh, the principle of non-interference in domestic affairs of ASEAN member states. Uh, and he said it's still seen as a main stumbling block to regional action. Also, as can be seen from the UNGA vote, there is no consensus on the arms embargo which was dealt with uh, earlier uh, by a panel speaker. Would individual ASEAN, ASEAN member states be prepared to join an emergency international coalition as suggested by the UN uh, Special Rapporteur Thomas An Andrews? And what are the options available? Um, perhaps I can give you a few seconds, Marzuki, to um, just, just uh, recapitulate um, exactly the response to this. A uh, particular question about ASEAN member states being prepared to join an emergency international coalition. Yes, uh, I, I'm all for for uh, uh, the international community being uh, constantly seized uh, of the situation in Myanmar. There has been a slack on the part of the UN. Uh, to be frank, uh, it, it has, of course. Uh, gone through the motions of, of uh, stating uh, concern, but if the United Nations is at all serious about this, uh, uh, it, it, would, it would be so easy for the Secretary General to announce that he is going to visit uh, Myanmar. And that will, that will immediately 
change the equation of what is going on at the moment. But short of that, uh, we can go with, with all kinds of uh, emergencies. Uh, and that would be, of course, uh, to uh, strengthen the, the international coalition uh, to exert pressure on, on, the, on the junta. But uh, then again, uh, uh, we are all waiting uh, for you know, the United Nations uh, to take the, the necessary steps uh, to break through uh, the, the impasse at the moment. Thank you very much for that, um, uh, uh, Marzuki. Now I move on to a question for Razia. Um, uh, this is a question from Ramat uh, from the Rohingya Society in Malaysia. Uh, my question to Razia is, I just want to know the situation of Rohingyas in Bachanchan. Chan. How many of them are there? How many, how are they living and what is their legal status? And in, in relation to that, uh, perhaps we can uh, also give you this question um, from Joseph Benedict, again via the chat box. The UNSR on Myanmar, Tom Andrews called at the Human Rights Council in Geneva for an emergency coalition for the people of Myanmar to, among other things, provide emergency humanitarian aid to the country. Would uh, He would be interested to know from, from you how realistic is this proposal. And then perhaps I can uh, also give you the floor to also... Um, um, uh, amplify again what you have commented on within the chat box earlier. So uh, the floor is yours, Razia. Thank you so much. The Bashancho issue is a very complicated uh, issue. And those who are working in Bangladesh, Cox's Bazaar, uh, as a humanitarian agency, we are not allowed to share anything. Also, uh, we cannot ask anything. And we know the situation is uh, uh, whatever. Uh, it's not good at all in this season. The season is very uh, dangerous and uh, the island is the middle of the sea and people cannot communicate even uh, uh, there are no UN agency can allow to go there even uh, uh, no journalist and uh, I, I can say I'm very sorry uh, to express my uh, Tuition uh, for the Bashan Chor because uh, it's very risky for me. If I if I expose anything or uh, anything, I say uh, it's uh, it will be uh, difficult for me to work in the Cox's Bazaar. And I know there is such a uh, uh, so many humanitarian activists who are all working on it, and that they can give very uh, good uh, information about it for me. Uh, it's uh, very difficult, uh, but what I can say, the Bashan Shore is not the solution. It's uh, it's uh, it, it's it's creating more problem. The people are try to jump in the sea to uh, skip this uh, island, and they don't want to stay over there. But uh, in other option, uh, the uh, Bangladesh uh, government say they are willingly go. But we know what uh, what is inside the story. But whatever. And about the uh, this city, uh, have to uh, talk to sit with the Bangladesh government uh, to find a solution uh, for the Abashanchar Island. If uh, for my concept, if we we try to move push in the Abashanchar Island, it's not a, a solution because the Myanmar Myanmar party, Myanmar authority, uh, they can find uh, a thing that uh, the Bangladesh are taking uh, responsibility for uh, the Rohingya. But Rohingya are not part of Bangladesh. They are part of Myanmar. It, it is good. We have to uh, more push to take back this uh, uh, Rohingya in their own country, not the Basanchar. Basanchar is never be a solution and it's, it's great only uh, the problems. And even the host community, the Bangladesh people, they don't want to uh, allow them in the, uh, their own uh, area because they say this is our land and why should we allow them? Whatever it is a rich place or not, but that is their land. And it shows uh, that uh, we are giving platform to the Myanmar that uh, uh, Bangladesh uh, one by one uh, take this burden for their, by their own. This is 
very complicated issue. So uh, uh, I know uh, Mrs. Mazuki also knew the Bangladesh situation. So for my uh, for my side as a Rohingya activist, uh, this uh, Basanchor is uh, is not a solution. Thank you very much for that, uh, and Razia. We don't need to well, and, and uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you. We lost you for a few um uh, split second there. Sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, to have so, your... no, yes, okay. go ahead. It's networking. Yes, it's yes. Okay. But uh, I, I have nothing to say about uh, the again uh, more about the person chart. Uh, so maybe uh, we can forward the other question to others. Uh, let's and uh, you everyone know. The Rohingya situation is not good at all in the Bangladesh refugee camp, and it's now the surrounded with the fields and the COVID situation with the more vulnerable. So whatever, and uh, the host community with the Rohingya, uh, the relationship is uh, day by day worse, and anything can happen anytime. So we have to find a way how to repatriate this uh, people or we can make a, a novel uh, environment for these people I think, thank you uh, very much uh, razia so much. Okay. because uh, in cox's but the communication is very bad that's why i, I it's okay you can follow. thank thank you so much uh we go to i i guess another round so i'm going to start with uh yu yun again and this is a comment to your uh, response earlier. Um, this is from Jose Pereira of uh, Timor Leste. Again, thank you very much for the explanation. And it's really hard for ASEAN to take any concrete intervention as the principles of consensus and non intervention or interference will be big challenges. We hope ASEAN could make a revision to its charter to open the way to ASEAN to have more space in protection and promotion of good governance and protection and promotion of human rights in Southeast Asian uh, countries. So that was a comment to you, um, um, uh, Yu Yun. But this is another question from Sekar Panulu, again from the chat box. How feasible is it for ASEAN member states to start giving recognition for the NUG? Um, at least, is there any vision to include them within any of the ASEAN meetings in the future? Um, uh, any of you can answer that, but I'd like to direct that to uh, Yu Yun. Uh, thank you very much. First, I would like to address the non-interference principle. Uh, I think everyone knows that uh, non-interference principle is not only the principle of, uh, of ASEAN, uh, but it is uh, in Article Two of the ASEAN Char uh, of the UN Charter, and there's a UN declaration on this. I think the 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 use of uh, this principle that has been rather uh, uh, different, uh, as ASEAN has jealously uh, guard this principle uh, very much. But but if we if we see the the practices so far, non-interference principle may not be used or or cannot be used with number of uh, requirements. First, there should be a commitment uh, of countries uh, on talking about uh, uh, domestic issues. And uh, secondly, there should be a space. That is why one of the reasons why in ICER we wanted to have specific agenda to talk about country human rights situation in which when we talk about human rights situation, no one will accuse us uh, of being uh, violating the principle of non-interference principle because this is allocated space. This is the space that we dedicate uh, to talk about uh, human rights issues of the countries. It is up to the countries whether they want to respond or not to respond. This is why this is not only uh, practice uh, the thing that we want to practice uh, in ASEAN. It's already practiced uh, in, in, in the world. So despite the fact the uh, ASEAN Charter Article 2 mentioned about a non-interference uh, principle, but we still have to talk about it. The, the requirement is that there is an agreement. Uh, in the UN, there is a resolution to talk about this. Uh, 
uh, human rights situation. And there is a, a council uh, before co committee was established. So there are a number of requirement condition to be there uh, when uh, non-interference uh, principle become irrelevant. So this is something that uh, in iChair we would like to establish. So no one will question us on, uh, on non-interference principle uh, when we talk about uh, human rights uh, uh, situation of the countries. But we need to establish this requirement in our uh, working. Uh, I think, uh, so I, in my understanding, I cannot speak on behalf of my government or any other ASEAN member state in relation to recognition of the NUG. Uh, but looking at the communication so far, uh, some of the ASEAN member states uh, had communicate, uh, has established communication with NUG. Uh, the last uh, news uh, from the Minister of Foreign Affairs of NUG also confirm this kind of uh, uh, situation. And, and I, I myself know uh, Indonesian government has contacted uh, several times CRPH and NUG. There has been number of uh, debate whether or not uh, official recognition is needed. Uh, some, some believe that uh, official recognition is not needed. Uh, we just do, uh, we just, working with uh, any legitimate government. So legitimacy actually uh, can be provided by the election. And in the case of Myanmar, it's very obvious that legitimate uh, government is the one that coming out as a result of the uh, election. And uh, uh, I think, um, oh, this is speculation, I should not say, but, um, but I think, uh, uh, now looking at how difficult uh, dealing, how difficult it is uh, for for ASEAN and member states to engage with that uh, more and more countries uh, now uh, explore possibilities to to engage with NUG. But I'm not sure to what extent it is going to have a, a official recognition. Maybe no need. I don't know. But that's uh, the situation right now. Thank you very much, Yu Yun. I guess um, uh, uh, perhaps I can also read this. You've uh, actually um, uh, partially answered the question on the role of national human rights institutions, uh, particularly in Myanmar. But I'd like to read this and uh, probably address it to anybody in the panel. But uh, of course, Marzuki is welcome to do that uh, at first track. So um, uh, curious to know what are the current efforts done by NHRIs in the region or even beyond in responding to the situation. I understand statements have been made and there is an effort to continue to engage with the uh, Myanmar National Human Rights Commission, but I'm curious to know what is the strategy of NHRIs and how NHRIs uh, involves civil society in the process. Um, there's also another question about um, uh, NHRIs as well. I cannot seem to find it right now. Um, but uh, perhaps I can give, uh, uh, being a former uh, chair of the Indonesian um, uh, Human Rights Commission, I, I think Marzuki is uh, best place to be able to answer that question. I would like to also invite my brothers from Suakam to also um, uh, briefly answer the question. We still have a few minutes more to go, so I, I suppose we can be a little bit more generous on this. So Marzuki, you have the floor. We also have uh, a Taufan <laughs> Damanik. Uh, yes. Uh, is, he, is he on this, uh, yeah. Taufan? Yeah, yeah. All right, but uh, let me just, Karen, uh, uh, rightly put, I think uh, the human rights commissions, human rights uh, institutions do have a role to play. And uh, this is a role that covers both the regional dimension, but also no less important is to engage their respective governments uh, to adopt a line, a, a particular line of, of action, policy line. Uh, and and therefore, a consensus within the among the national human rights institutions is, is important as to how uh, things are being looked at in in Myanmar. 
uh, and what needs to be what needs to be uh, uh, pushed uh, further uh, compared to other issues uh, within the context of what is happening there. Uh, one uh, point that you raised was this uh, issue of uh, recognition of the NUG, and and therefore uh, the challenge is, I think, also on the part of the National Human Rights Commissions uh, to, uh, in a way, uh, push things along within their national uh, constituencies, including the governments, uh, uh, to, to move in this, in this direction. But uh, then again, uh, it does take two uh, to, to move things forward. And therefore the NUG might want to be proactive, in fact, in uh, making sure that they are being recognized as the legitimate government uh, within ASEAN. And therefore, the, the, the idea perhaps is to uh, come out with a blanket policy of designating their envoys in ASEAN to replace the envoys that have been there uh, so far. And therefore, uh, uh, pushing ASEAN to make a decision which party to recognize. Uh, so uh, that could be done by the NUG almost immediately. It, it just needs a decision by the NUG that uh, they have now designated 10 new envoys to ASEAN to represent the Myanmar as the state. Yeah. Uh, so now this this line could be pushed by the national commissions uh, to encourage uh, their governments to 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 acknowledge that, and so uh, these are issues, now, little little things that that uh, add up to a, a very significant uh, change in the way ASEAN looks at at the NUG because that that is the game that is going to be played. Uh, in, in almost in, in almost immediately, and uh, it, it does uh, figure uh, with regard. In fact, I may have to say this bluntly: the future of NUG depends on recognition by ASEAN. In fact, recognition by ASEAN is so much more important than recognition or non-recognition by the international community. The junta is more concerned about how ASEAN looks at Myanmar than what anybody there in Geneva or New York is saying about the junta. Forget about that. This is real politics, and therefore, uh, this is uh, the area that needs to be where the NUG needs to play an effective role. Thank you very much, Marzuki. Just, just a comment again from the Zoom chat box uh, relating to that particular issue from Mark Azavedo. He did say maybe Marzuki would like to comment, and you did already. He resolutely spoke of two sides in Myanmar. Truth is, I would not like to catalog how many sides there are. That is important. It's equally important to understand that many sides gain from the current chaos, not just the Tatmada or Junta. We have not even begun to uh, catalog this reality, never mind reconciling all uh, stakeholders in Burmese society. But I, I have a question from uh, Jose Pereira of Timor-Leste, and this is actually addressed to His Excellency from the Ministry of Human Rights of Myanmar regarding the action of Myanmar National Human Rights Commission on the human rights violations that have been taking place. So can we have a comment from our... Uh, from our colleague uh, on this issue, if uh, he's still here, to his ex Ministry of Human Rights in Myanmar. Uh, Yu Yun would like to answer that. Yes. No, no I do not want to answer the question <laughs> for Minister. <laughs> but I would like to second what Pak Marzuki has proposed because that okay. I, I was also uh, thinking the same. Uh, if NUG, the minister, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs or the Ministry of Human Rights can send uh, a representative of ICHER 
uh, perhaps this is something that uh, create a, a dynamic uh, in 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 ASEAN. Well, uh, I, uh, I I suggested to start with ITER because we do not uh, have some kind of uh, geographical jurisdiction authority. Uh, while the rest like uh, ASEAN social cultural and others, so they might have that kind of uh, implication, but ITER doesn't have because it's organ. So perhaps uh, this is something that Minister Ong Myo Min wanted to consider uh, to uh, to have the representative from uh, NUG uh, in ITER or in ACWC. So do we have um, uh, our uh, friend from uh, the Ministry of Myanmar, Ministry of uh, uh. Human rights. Commissioner Karen, I think the yes. minister has left. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, yeah, I think just to All let right. you know. Yeah. Okay. Uh, sorry for that. Um, uh, but uh, it is there. I'll invite you in the last uh, perhaps uh, four minutes of our discussion to just uh, recapitulate and uh, reaffirm what uh, the messages that you have um, uh, presented earlier on. So allow me just to uh, devote a few minutes to also um, acknowledge those who actually took time and commented and I haven't um, uh, I haven't acknowledged. This is from Ryan Silverio. It's a comment. I truly agree with Commissioner Gerald regarding opportunities to create dialogue with the MNHRC and Myanmar. Time to explore multi multilateralism beyond ASEAN. ASEAN's consensus principle paralyzes any effort to address violence. And then, of course, um, um, uh, from uh, Muhammad Sadek in the Zoom chat box as well, immediate democratic transition may be revealed, may reveal justice, I think, is the way um, uh, I understood it. Okay. Um, uh, this, is a, this is a factual, uh, this is a question uh, involving a factual answer, perhaps a, uh, any of the members of the panel can actually um, answer this. From Yu Mei Moon, uh, the UN General Assembly has ordered an arms embargo on the junta. Has it been carried out? Any? No, any, no it hasn't been no. carried out. So, okay. There are uh, dealings between the junta and Russia. Yes. From Jimmy Chok, church-based Malaysia, Myanmar ministry via Zoom uh, chat box as well. On the point on limiting military supply and support for the junta over the years, Commissioner Gerald mentioned that success has not been forthcoming. Is there any report from any source on the matter as to the reasons for the failure? Anyone from the panel can answer that. How was that again, Karen? Uh, there's been, uh, sorry, sorry, I didn't catch on the point On the point of limiting military supply and support for the junta over the years, uh, it was mentioned by Commissioner Gerald, actually, that success has not been forthcoming. Is there any report from any source on the matter as to the reasons for the failure of limiting the military supply? That's how I understood it. Maybe Gerald could answer that. <laughs> no. I, I think, Mazuki, uh, I was hoping that in your fact-finding mission report, uh, the basic feeling of all of us have is that there's so many pronouncements of uh, arms embargo at the UN, at other multilateral uh, forums, but the implementation never seemed to work. So I think this uh, person is asking, has there been a study or some reports or some uh, articulation on why it it fails, yeah. Money. <laughs> well, there's so many reports, uh, uh, Gerald. Uh, I mean, uh, arms embargo are motions that uh, go into a, a, a set of measures uh, to impose sanctions. But uh, in, a, in, in a very significant way, uh, it uh, only becomes a, a hindrance rather than than a uh, clear uh, uh, what is this barrier uh, for any government that seeks 
arms uh, to uh, weaponize itself against its population uh, or uh, to defend itself. So, uh, arms embargo is fine, uh, but its effectiveness may be limited because it's a super industry in the world that finds its way uh, in, in, to, to, to further its interest in any way it can, it can uh, uh, do, you know. So uh, it's, it's fine uh, to call for an arms embargo, but at the same time to uh, realistically uh, acknowledge that uh, it, it, it just constitutes one measure among so many other measures that need to be implemented. Thank you for that. Um, uh, another comment from Lo Kim Peng of Suakam. The dialogue today is very good. Is good. What is the next action to stop torturing of victims detained by military? I'm going to finish off um, uh, uh, the comments that uh, from the uh, participants, and then I'm going to give you the floor for just um, uh, maybe a minute each to just uh, to just give your final messages before we close the dialogue. Um, are there any more? Okay. There is a, again, uh, from Lo Kim Peng of Suakam, there is serious violation of human rights, especially many civil societies, uh, organizations, uh, many civil society um, are being tortured. What is the role of NHRIs in Myanmar that was already answered? And this is a last question that we, we will have. Another question for Ms. Yu Yun and uh, Mr. Marzuki, is there any possibility for ASEAN members to raise the issue of Myanmar and request for intervention through the UN. Before you answer, um, uh, I'd like to uh, perhaps just give the uh, last uh, minute to uh, Razia if you need to, if you want to just give your final message and then I will leave it to Yu Yun and Marzuki for their uh, final minute as well to close this panel discussion. Razia, Razia you have the floor. Everyone know about the ASEAN is strong, uh, uh, the strong, uh, sorry, strong power in this region. I think uh, they are the one who can uh, uh, find a solution, and also the some countries, especially Malaysia, Indonesia, Singapore, they can. Uh, push the ASEAN's uh, group so they can uh, uh, negotiate or any kind of uh, um, solution um, they can uh, do. But uh, I always uh, frustrating about the ASEAN's uh, um, activity. Uh, they are never think about uh, in the past also and now also they never uh, think about uh, the Myanmar inside issue. They are only uh, trying increase the relation develop with the Myanmar. Sorry, it's the democratic government or uh, military government. They are always equal here. But now the time is changed, and we have to uh, push uh, some Asian country. Not all ASEAN countries, I know they are not supportive about Rohingya issue or in other ethnic issue, but some, especially Indonesia, Malaysia, uh, and uh, uh, Singapore, uh, and, uh, they, can, uh, they can give their approach in this issue. So it is smart. So thank you. Thank you very much, Razia. Um, uh, uh, perhaps um, Marzuki, uh, for your uh, one minute roundup. Uh, well, can, uh, two things. One is, of course, to uh, commend the IHA for conducting this uh, uh, dialogue and hoping that uh, this might not be the first, uh, the only one. And as we move forward, I understand that there's going to be more dialogues about uh, about Myanmar. And so, uh, uh, in, in, in the course of, of these uh, activities, I think uh, an inclusive approach needs to be taken. And to draw Myanmar into the into the process, you know, uh, even even if it has to start with the existing national human rights commissions. Yeah, so uh, get everybody on board on this. Uh, we want to have a, a very inclusive kind of process uh, within ASEAN. And, and secondly, 
uh, maybe maybe uh, looking at the broader picture, we're looking at uh, the US now showing somewhat more interest in, in what is happening there. And therefore, uh, welcoming that, but also looking at uh, what uh, China also could uh, contribute to this. So let's not, let's not uh, foreclose that possibility, keep an open mind and uh, try all uh, possibilities uh, to get things uh, in place so that uh, we end this suffering as soon as possible because uh, it, it cannot take its own course. Uh, this cannot be resolved solely by Myanmar. It has to be, uh, uh, in a way, uh, accompanied by like-minded and, and uh, sympathetic neighbors uh, so that uh, we see we see uh, through this a whole uh, drama and, and tragedy. Thank you very much, Marzuki. Kapatid, you yun. Thank you, Karen. Uh, thank you very much for all the questions, responses, and comments. I I really I like this uh, dialogue, and this is something that we need to do. And uh, and we hope to have more uh, discussion like this with different uh, stakeholders, including. Uh, institutions inside uh, Myanmar, uh, the national human institution, and and hopefully if NUG appoint uh, the representative to I chair, then we can have uh, the person uh, in uh, to uh, to have a discussion with us. Uh, just to touch upon what uh, Jose Pereira mentioned earlier, whether ASEAN member states uh, wanted to um, ask UN to intervene. Actually, the UN already asked. ASEAN to intervene. So I think um, it is not like like that. It's, it's ra rather vice, vice versa. But uh, uh, I, it, in, in this, it is in the schedule that until the end of this year, uh, we are going to have uh, more dialogues uh, with different uh, stakeholders. Uh, uh, today is with, uh, with some of the uh, limited in, uh, uh, stakeholders, but we hope to expand uh, voices uh, to gather uh, more different voices inside Myanmar and also international. So we hope that by the end of the year, perhaps we can come up with something uh, that we can uh, hold together and uh, uh, hopefully to contribute to uh, uh, to lease the situation, to to reduce the, the suffering uh, in inside Myanmar. Thank you very much, Yu Yun. And um, uh, I'm not going to attempt to uh, summarize everything because we do have our closing remarks as well. It's been a pleasure to moderate this panel. I've learned a lot. Thank you very much for your um, uh, thoughts and, of course, the participation of all our um, uh, our uh, well participants here. And it's been really an honor coming from the Commission on Human Rights of the Philippines to be moderating. Thank you to Suhakam, Komnasam, and Timor Leste, and of course, the um, uh, ICHO representatives of Indonesia, Thailand, and Malaysia for this. Uh, and we hope to continue the dialogue. I turn you over now to our MC, Komarenten. Thank you, Commissioner Karen, uh, for uh, moderating the open discussion. Uh, I think uh, you have done a great job in keeping the discussions very lively and inclusive. Uh, we take this opportunity to record our appreciation to Mr. Jared Joseph and the other speakers of the panel discussions and all the participants for the meaningful in in inputs, either coming on the floor or taking the chat box. We shall now proceed uh, with the closing remarks. Um, I'm pleased to invite uh, Mr. Taufan uh, Dynamic, the chairperson of National Human Rights Commissioner of Indonesia, Kamnasam. Uh, Pak Taufan, the floor is all yours. Ah. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. All my colleagues, uh, this first regional dialogue marks a series of regional 
dialogues on human rights and democratization in uh, Myanmar. I would like to uh, convey my sincere appreciation to the Suhakam uh, for organizing this event with support from the Commission on Human Rights of the Philippines, uh, National Commission of Human Rights of Indonesia, so Komnasam, uh, National Commission uh, of Human Rights of Timor Leste, PGHG, uh, AICHA Indonesia, AICHA Ma Malaysia, and also uh, AICHA Thailand. The collaboration between NHRIs uh, and representatives from AICHA aim to get uh, updates about the human rights situation in Myanmar and to provide a platform for stakeholders uh, in the Southeast Asia region to discuss the best uh, possible ways to move forward, intending to contrib contribute towards restoring democracy and human rights situation in uh, Myanmar. In today's dialogue, uh, beyond the five consensus, uh, the five point consensus, looking at uh, other options available, we try to find uh, a variety of point of, of view, uh, possible solution and proposed activities as an alternative from the five point consensus issued at the ASEAN leaders meeting uh, April 24, uh, 2021. Mm -hmm. Just in the first regional dialogue, we've already obtained productive and uh, constructive dialogue uh, that broaden our perspective and possible approaches uh, to human rights and dem democratization in Myanmar. I hope this uh, first part of regional dialogue can lay a foundation of cooperation that can be useful for our fellow partners in Myanmar. As stated by Suhakam as a CNF chair, during the first uh, technical working group in April uh, 2021 and by ICHA at the 33 meeting of ICHA uh, April 2021 that expressed its readiness to assist and extend our help and support to Myanmar and Myanmar National Human Rights Commission in any task during this difficult time. Lastly, I would like to appreciate all speakers, Ms. Yoyun, Mr. Majuki Darusman, Mr. Thomas Andrews, and also Ms. Rajia Sultana, and of course, all participants for their views and insight into this dialogue. Hopefully, the deteriorating condition of Myanmar democracy and human rights situation will soon end. I hope to see you in the next series of regional dialogue and wish everyone safe and healthy. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, Patofan. Last but not least, we take the honor to invite the representative of ASEAN Intergovernmental Commission of Human Rights of uh, uh, Representative of Malaysia, His Excellency, Eric Paulson, to kindly deliver his closing remark. Uh, Thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you, Suhakam, for organizing uh, this particular important uh, dialogue. Uh, I don't intend to uh, repeat the, the, the messages of appreciation that has been said by uh, Pak Taufan. Of course, I adopt uh, everything that he has said. Uh, but allow me a few moments uh, 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 for me to uh, um, you know, uh, speak my mind uh, on this particular issue. While there is a lot of international attention and solidarity uh, for the people of Myanmar, uh, there is a limit to what they can do to rein in the Tatmadaw. Statements of condemnation, diplomatic isolation, and sanctions imposed by the West without stronger UN Security Council uh, measures have not had the desired effect on the military. The UN Security Council has met on several occasions to discuss Myanmar, but remained deadlocked due to the threat of a, of a veto from Russia and China. There is a huge gap between what the people of Myanmar need and what the international community can do. Despite the reservations that have been expressed uh, on the ASEAN Five Point Consensus, the international community and all stakeholders must still work together with ASEAN. ASEAN does not work in isolation or in exclusion of others. The UN and other states are also working on different tracks to help resolve the crisis. But they also recognize that ASEAN is probably best place to engage with the Tatmadaw, even though it is not designed nor equipped to handle such a crisis. 
China, Russia, the US, the EU, India, Japan will all play a role in both supporting ASEAN and working with other like-minded states and the UN to help resolve the crisis, although they may not all have the same end goals. All these countries have more leverage on Myanmar than ASEAN, but the absence of a coordinated stra strategy can unfortunately be counterproductive. Despite the early mixed messages, ASEAN must move forward as, as it has committed to the five-point consensus. It is not all on ASEAN to address the situation in Myanmar. At the end of the day, the future of Myanmar must be, de must be de determined by its own people. But ASEAN must do its part by appointing a special envoy without further delay. Crucially, the special envoy must have a full and flexible mandate, and his or her office must be properly staffed, funded, and supported so that constructive dialogue can begin as soon as possible. Once the special envoy has been appointed, the, the immediate priorities must be to convince the Tatmadaw to cease violence against unarmed, unarmed civilians and to release Aung San Suu Kyi and other political prisoners so that dialogue can begin with all parties concerned, including the NUG, CRPH, civil disobedience movement, and the ethnic armed groups. This is crucial as without wide-ranging and inclusive participation, the dialogue process will struggle to find broad-based support from the Myanmar people. But appointing the special envoy has proven to be much more difficult than it should be. Almost three months on since the ASEAN leaders meeting in Jakarta, the special envoy has yet to be appointed and valuable momentum and goodwill uh, has been lost. Despite the five-point consensus, ASEAN members differ in their stakes, leverage and sense of urgency in dealing with the crisis. Further, as can be seen from last month's vote at the UN General Assembly on the resolution uh, on Myanmar, ASEAN members are split on how best to deal with Myanmar. And that has reflected on the lack of a common position on the envoy's uh, role, mandate, and authority. Because ASEAN's influence lies in its capacity to persuade the Tatmadaw, not the presence of rules which could be enforced, the lack of inter internal consensus can only limit ASEAN's influence on Myanmar. None of this is ideal, but ASEAN must do what is practical at any point in time and keep moving in the right direction. It, it will be a long, hard road ahead. One only needs to look at the various crises around the world to know that wanting the right and principal outcome is easier said than done. While various stakeholders may know what they want to achieve, peace, stability, normality, safety, security, federalism, democracy, con constitutional government, human rights, and so forth, there are trust and confidence that must be built, compromises that must be ne negotiated, realistic outcomes that must be considered. The exact route and how long this process takes can only be decided in time by all the parties and stakeholders involved in the dialogue process when that comes. For now, the situation seems uh, bleak. The window of opportunity for dialogue seems more remote with each passing day as the SAC seeks to consolidate power and authority while its opponent, the NUG, CRPH, protesters, uh, the ethnic armed groups, seeks to oust them from, from power. Regardless of what ASEAN does or does not do, the future of Myanmar lies within the country and especially its young people who are determined to alter the course of their country's history, but they will need support. The UN Security Council must pass a resolution on Myanmar whether on, on a global arms embargo, accountability, or for humanitarian access. But that can only be done if China is on board. China's involvement uh, is crucial due to its, uh, its border with Myanmar, economic clout, and connection with many of the ethnic armed groups. While continuing Western sanctions are important, the SAC can survive with China's support and its other neighbors, namely Thailand and India. Japan is also important, but it has re recently said that it will not impose sanctions on Myanmar. Lastly, the international community must continue supporting Myanmar's vulnerable population and those working for the broad transformation of its democracy and society. Uh, that is all from, from, from my closing remarks. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, His Excellency Eric Paulson, for the thought-provoking prov insights. Excellencies, chairpersons, commissioners, esteemed speakers, distinguished guests, editors, journalists, ladies and gentlemen, we have now arrived at the end of the session. 
We hope the enriching and meaningful discussion will catalyze the re restoration of peace, democracy, and human rights in Myanmar. We will share information on the next regional dialogue on democratization and human rights in Myanmar soon. Hopefully, we will have the remaining NHRIs and IHR representatives joining us on board. We also look forward for other stakeholders to join us. On that note, I would sincerely appreciate them to everyone for keeping the space safe and respectful throughout the session. Thank you, and we wish everyone safety and well being. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>